Hey class, welcome to week seven. We're almost done. It's been uh, quite a journey. Uh, I have to say that uh, I never would have expected that at the beginning of this eight-week course that uh, I'd be where I was at personally right now. Uh, so there, I'm sure many of you have seen the post. I put it recently about my uh, close cousin, Mark, who was really hurt in a motorcycle accident on Friday. Um, it's just unbelievable. It's just preoccupied all my time from about Friday at 12.40 when I got the phone call um, through Monday evening. and um, I did take uh, a moment with all of you on the live chat Saturday morning. I didn't want to distract you from the chat. and I, It was actually a moment for me to kind of escape for a little bit that morning, that hour I spent with you guys. But outside of that, it was uh, pretty, uh, pretty much spent down at the hospital with the family. A really good time in regards to uh, the body of Christ coming together and lifting up one another and praying for one another. His wife has been so strong in this. They have a six-year-old little boy who they've been, you know, trying to protect but also help in this time. And so, if any of you are interested, you can always go to PrayForTheLambers.com and take a look at all the wonderful posts that are up there. I mean, people from all over the country, different churches. Uh, some people that know my cousin and his, you know, his family, and some who don't, and it's just been it's been a really good time uh, to see how people can uh, bind together in a time of tragedy, and most importantly, bind together in the name of Christ, um, knowing that if God so chooses, He can heal my cousin, uh, but uh, if He doesn't, it's still okay, because He has used this to glorify Himself. Mark will be, obviously, he's a Christian, a strong Christian, and I trust that he will be with the Lord, even if he does die. But um, anyways, that's where I have been at, and as you know, my grandfather passed away three weeks ago. It's just, he said, I guess sometimes it happens. Um, for some reason, it seems to happen often around the holidays, doesn't it? That said, um, I think most of you have gotten in your papers through the little write-up I had you do about um, the body snatchers. In fact, I've noticed that it's only here on Tuesday night. Only a few of you have gotten me the body snatchers, so please get those to me ASAP. Um, those of you who are trying to catch up, there's only a couple of you out there that have contacted me and explained your situation why you're behind on a couple papers, and we're working with you on those. There are a couple out there who have just dropped off the radar, so I'm assuming you've dropped the class. Um, you can look at the grade book and see what assignments so far that I've got in there. I don't have Citizen Kane in there yet. And obviously the Body Snatcher one's not in there yet. Um, and I believe I've... You know, I actually don't have the live chats up. I'll get those up here real shortly. But uh, you should know if you did the live chat 1 and 2. So live chat 3 is scheduled for Thursday night. I might uh, postpone that. Um, due to um, an event going on with my family down at the hospital. Um, I, I will put that up in an announcement bold saying that when I will reschedule it. I might reschedule it for um, this Saturday morning. But um, anyway, so that, that's where we're at with that. Um, if you have any questions, please um, feel free to call me. Um, I know we're getting towards the end of the semester here. And I don't want you to get lost and behind. I'll put my uh, number up on the discussion board as well. I'm sorry, the announcement. And then also, um, you know, I'll just say here, 951-212-9545. That's 951-212-9545. If it's something simple, just a quick question that can wait, shoot me an email. But if it is something urgent or you really need to kind of talk through a, a couple things, feel free to give me a call. Uh, so with that, tonight we're going to be talking about the new wave. Now, um, you know, the, the class has followed the development of film, uh, how it has interacted with culture, how culture has influenced it. Um, and we also have seen, like I said, the development of it as an art form. And it's very early forms. It's almost just kind of like a, a camera capturing a slice of life to something uh, very powerful that can tell stories from multiple points of view with very stylistic camera shots and lighting. So 
um, I, I hope you've seen that this has developed and, and the language that has developed, um, especially during the golden era, the 30s, 40s, and 50s, where uh, that invisible editing, as I think the book refers to it, um, a form, you know, the editing uh, that was influenced kind of by some of Griffith and Eisenstein's uh, uh, style of editing, particularly Eisenstein's whole idea of montage. And uh, then it became um, invisible editing, that you could have multiple shots all put together to make one scene. Uh, and we don't think about that, do we? Uh, watch a movie this day and age, watch an old movie, and uh, you will um, not really say, wow, that was fantastic editing. I mean, maybe in a, in a quick music montage or some sort of action sequence, you might notice it a little bit more, but you don't notice it cutting from one person to the next as they have a conversation and from a wide shot to a close up to a medium shot. We really don't think about those sort of things, but they do exist. And when we talk about it as a, a part of the language, um, it's invisible to us. It is invisible editing. And all of those shots, um, they, they convey um, subliminal messages to us. And I'm not talking about a conspiracy theory of subliminal messages, but if you put that camera where you're looking down on the subject, well, the subject, main, main, mainly me right here, I'm below the camera, and so that puts you in a position um, where you're looking down on me. And that's just, that is built into the psyche of a human being. Now... If all of a sudden the camera is looking up at me and I'm looming over the camera, well, there I am. I'm in a position of authority. I'm, I'm above you. And that, and that comes from our de childhood development. As children, we looked up to our parents and to adults around us, and we felt they were in a position of authority. And as we're older and we look down upon them, we see them as children and smaller and somebody that uh, is under our authority. Well, wherever you place a camera and how close you put a camera to, to somebody and how far or wide you put a camera... You can convey isolation, you can f convey closeness, you can convey authority, you can convey uh, oppression, all by how the camera is placed. Add to that lighting, you can make things look very dark and, uh, let's see if I can do that here, dark and, and shadowed and creeping in the corner. Ooh, who is this guy? Or you can have really well-lit, bright, sunny days and, you know, all of that taps into our psyche. And uh, that's when we, what we're really talking about. We talk about how the language developed and how film, not by just what is happening on screen action-wise, not just how the story is un, uh, unfolding for us, but how it's portrayed really conveys a lot of the message that the filmmaker is working on. So when we talk about the new wave, what we're going to talk about is a group of guys and eventually grows into a movement in Europe. It begins in France. The French New Wave is a bunch of guys who begin to break the rules. Yep, uh, every generation has to have them. And they are looking at particularly the Hollywood style of making a movie. Seamless editing or invisible editing as it's often referred to. Um, dramatic camera angles. Uh, well-lit sets or, or very polished movies, great sound and, um, you know, everything put together and it's just a really fantastic package and they want to break the rules because they start to see it becoming part of the, um, I, I guess they start to see it becoming an everyday movie. And they wanted to see, how can we stretch this medium? How can we open it up and make it new, make it fresh, and make it something that, as art is, always developing and always changing, instead of just being stuck in a mold? And remember, we talked about, even in the early days of Hollywood, um, the studios were set up very much like factories. And even as certain artists or directors had power, like you know Orson Welles or Alfred Hitchcock or John Ford, they still had to produce within this factory model. And so a lot of the movies, even though they had different stories, different ways of telling the stories, they still had a similar vibe, if that makes any sense. So this new wave is all about kind of trying to break that vibe, push the envelope, and make something fresh and new. So in the next section, we'll talk about that. All right.